Hey everyone, welcome back for episode 10 of Fabulous Duo Short Stories. Hello, I'm Michelle. This is Kristen. Bonjour. And uh, yeah, today we've got two new stories for you. And I think last week was our live, right? Last week was our live, our April Fool's live that you all seem to have a good chuckle over. Yeah, the live stream crashed. That was yeah. great. That was not a joke. I want to repeat, that was not a joke. Um, but yeah, so our next live is going to be on when? May? Six. Seven. Oh. <laughs> I have actually also received gifts of whoopee cushions for people. So that's something after last live. So, yeah. Nice. Um, Then without further ado, let's move on to the first story. Our first story is Kristen's story. And the prompt for it was somebody kidnaps your cat. And what do you do? It's called Queen of the Shadows. It was another late night of gaming with Michelle, but what did it matter? Neither of us had work the next day. By the time it was two in the morning, we called it and signed off, ready to crash in bed. I had ensured the lights were out throughout the house and that the doors were all locked before brushing my teeth and then closing up my bedroom doors so I could sleep undisturbed. Umbra jumped up onto the bed and nestled herself on her stack of cat beds. You know what? That's hilarious. <laughs> she got so many beds. She's literally sleeping on three beds. Curling up into a ball and also ready to end her night. I felt like I was suffocating suddenly and opened my eyes. It was still dark and I could see Umbra sitting up watching towards the edge of my bed. My body wouldn't move. I couldn't scream or do anything but wiggle one of my toes. A dark shadowy hand reached up just to the side of my right foot, then a second hand to my left. One by one on both sides, it began to pull itself until it had crawled up my legs and was heading straight towards my body. The shadowy figure pressed itself down onto my body as if it was trying to take over and I felt myself gasping for air. As my eyes darted around the room, trying to figure out what was happening, I saw that a second shadowy figure had been there the entire time. I wasn't sure if it was watching to ensure the job was completed until I noticed it seemed to have its gaze set on Umbra the entire time. The shadowy figure reached out its long arms and with its claw-like fingers, it scooped her up and stepped back into the shadows, disappearing. I quickly calmed my breath and closed my eyes as if I was resigning to the figure on top of me. The moment it let its guard down and attempted to plunge into my body completely, I had built up an orb of light in my core, which burst, causing the shadowy figure to disintegrate into nothingness. I sprang up from my bed, shaking and looking around. She was gone. They took her. I had suppressed my angelic essence for so long, I almost forgot how to use my celestial energies, and it caused me to allow my cat to be stolen from me. I closed my eyes and held my hands together in front of my heart, channeling my energy, circulating light through myself to ensure my body had not been damaged or tainted by the darkness. After ensuring that there was no dark blight buildup in my system, I put my hands down and approached my altar. I gathered my pendulum, some salt and herbs, a few crystals and a couple of candles, then headed to a larger space. I began to pour the salt in a circle around myself, placing a candle on specific points, denoting the elements and their respective cardinal direction. To the east, a yellow candle with a feather carved into it to welcome the air that will help me find that which is lost and provide me with clarity and boundless creative energies to aid my search. To the south, a red candle with a flame carved into it to welcome the fire that will burn with my passion and reinvigorate my energies, providing me with the strength for this journey. To the west, a blue candle with a droplet carved into it to invite the spirits of water to grant me their protection and purification. Lastly, to the north, a green candle with a stone carved into it, inviting the earth to help keep me grounded and provide me with stability. 
Around the circle, I had lit a ring of white candles to help provide me with the protection from any negative entities. As I sat in the circle, chanting my requests for aid from the elements, the salt began to glow and everything was starting to distort. Within the ring of salt, the floor beneath me turned black and I slowly sank into its depths. It felt like I was passing through a viscous liquid of sorts, but my clothing remained dry. On the other side, the candles were all inverted in elements and color. The protective white ring was all black candles and all of their flames were blue. The flames were all dancing, and as I watched, I noticed that one of the flames was getting smaller, while the others stayed the same. After studying the surrounding area for about an hour, I realized that the flame that was shrinking had completely gone out, and the next one began doing the same. It was a timer for the portal. If I can't find Umbra and get her back before this portal closes, we would be trapped here for who knows how long. Pulling out my pendulum and channeling my celestial essence into it, the chain began to shake and the crystal lifted up and pointed in a direction for me to follow. Sneaking through the shadow land was tougher than expected as the light that shone for me was clearly different from the lights that lit up this dark dwelling. Strangely enough, aside from the overall appearance of this place looking menacingly eerie, the feeling wasn't terribly off-putting. It almost felt common, almost. Continuing forward, I could hear the sound of chanting, but the words weren't clear. It was as if they were speaking multiple languages at once into a single sound. A few large shadows caught my eye as I was trying to get closer to listen to the chanting, and it seemed they were on patrol. Carefully approaching them from behind, I concentrated energy into the tips of my fingers, coating my nails in a sharp aura of light. In a swift motion, I plunged both of my hands into their backs like claws piercing through to where their hearts should be. Clenching my fists still inside their bodies, the energy erupted and the shadows faded from existence. I noticed the chanting had stopped and went back around to take a peek inside. As I turned my head around the corner, I was face to face with a thin, long, spiky shadow that just grinned and turned its head sideways, laughing at me before it tried to lunge towards me. I sidestepped and almost lost my balance due to some strange substance on the floor leaking from the creature. Coating myself in divine energy, I stomped into the sludge and caused a shockwave of light to disperse it, allowing me to move freely. As I leapt backwards, I pulled out some long, sharpened selenite crystals from my pocket and threw them at the creature with full force, piercing right into its eyes. As it melted down into the floor, creating a puddle, the crystals began to vibrate and were suddenly launched back at me. Trying to dodge them, they sliced my arms a bit, but was the least of my worries as the melted shadow had formed into a strange ball and floated up, then exploded, letting out a large shriek. The sound of screams and that strange language could be heard all around where I was standing, and one by one, the shadow creatures appeared, all shapes and sizes with the same smiles on their faces. Knowing that this would be too much to handle just by careful planning, I channeled, all, I channeled all of the divine energy I had in me. My body was pulsating. I could feel the blood rushing through my arms and legs. Multiple bursts of light sprouted from my back, creating a set of wings, and a crown formed onto my head. My true form was awakened and finally revealed. However, this vessel was not created with the intention of ever using this form, which could cause it to collapse and break in mere moments as I would just get a new vessel under another name. I had to focus on getting Umber back. Dashing through the army of shadows, piercing them with my claws of light and releasing a barrage of feathers, I felt the energy waning within me. There was no sign of Umbra and this army seemed to have been planning this for a long time based on their level of preparation. My wings were fading with my energy, which was evident by the fact that I had only two remaining. This body was heavy and could feel the burden of the celestial energies bursting through the flesh. In a last ditch attempt to escape and find Umbra, I flew up high and began chanting. All the light sources around swirled towards me and fed into my core. I raised a hand up to the sky and quickly swung downwards. As my hand fell to my side, so did a rain of light on everything around me. Beams striking down, completely obliterating the shadows, giving me an opportunity to fly forward into the area with the previous chanting. 
As I landed and made my way into the strange building, my last two wings had flickered out and my energy diminished. Staggering forward with my arms bleeding and energy fading with every step, I saw a large stone throne ahead. It was not clear who was on the throne, as it was just a large shadow, and by this time my vision had blurred. I have to say this. <laughs> Gotta do it again. <laughs> <clears throat> you did well, Meowster. An elegant voice called out. A dark rush of shadows engulfed me, and I felt as though I was drowning. They receded after a few moments, and I gasped for air. Strangely enough, my body felt much better. My wounds were healed, and my body was no longer breaking apart. Once my vision had returned, I saw Umbra sitting on the throne, watching me. Confused, I called out to her. What? What is happening here? Are they sacrificing you, or how did I get healed? I am one of the three queens of the shadows. Your intuition was sharp enough that when you named me Umbra, you happened to be correct. My sisters Penumbra and Antumbra are elsewhere doing business, she mewed gracefully. That doesn't explain what's happening here. Did you orchestrate this entire thing? I asked while filled with confusion. You see, light and dark cannot exist without each other. The moment you picked that vessel, I had prepared to be born in this one. Although younger in human years, this body ages at a much faster rate than yours, which allows me to grow my power to be stronger than yours for now. Still confused, I stood there with a puzzled look on my face and further pressed on with questioning. But why would you do this to me? Maybe Michelle ever since... What? May okay, but that's maybe Michelle ever since uh, maybe Michelle since every time she visits she steals your space on the bed, but not me. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. She jumped off her throne and approached me while shrinking back down to a more familiar state that I was used to seeing. Your celestial energies fluctuate rapidly when you are sleeping. I had to watch over you and ensure you did not go out of control and cause damage to the earth and throw the balance of things into chaos. However, as I chose this cat vessel, some of its attributes are being adapted into me. Like testing you as my owner needlessly to see if you cared enough to save me. <laughs> Dumbfounded by this response, I scooped her up and headed back to the portal. You're cut off from treats. I glared at her in my arms as she curled up into a ball. As we approached the portal, I tossed her in, then went through before the final candle had extinguished. Although I was exhausted, I had begun picking up the candles and putting them away, then sweeping up the salt from the floor. Finally, I fell onto my bed and passed out, asleep again. A hand began to pat my hair as I slept, and that same elegant voice echoed. I knew you would come for me, and as such, I will be by your side, protecting you for eternity. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> right? right? That, yeah. <laughs> it's I, not John Wick, but it. No, that was really good. Like, um, it was like, oh, so you know, holy shit, all this is happening. In the end it was a joke. This this cat. And and, and yes, cats do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. It's a cat. <laughs> Turns out I'm a celestial being who ended up in the vessel of a cat, and I had to fuck with you. <laughs> I, I had to fuck with you. <laughs> I just, I, I must. If only I was a dog, <laughs> but I'm a cat. <laughs> For anyone out there that has a cat, let us know if you agree that your cats are like this. Question mark. <laughs> are like they like this? this? I understand that I am one of the only few celestial beings on Earth. Um, so you may not all have the same situation where you have a, uh, a cat that is also a celestial, but, um, regular cats are pretty shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> let us know. Yeah. yeah. Well then. <laughs> that okay. happened. Hey, that happened. <laughs> that was the thing. And, like, for real though, um, Umbra... I hate when Michelle comes over because, like, 
I'm just leave now because you're gonna lay on my spot anyways. All I do is sit on the bed. Like, I, like I'll just sit on the bed or the couch. And she's like, these are all my places. <laughs> you can, I'm gonna leave the bed because you sat on the couch. How could you? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then she won't like care about me. And then like when I'm, you know, just not doing anything, she'll be rubbing up on my leg. And I'll be like, well, you didn't want me to pet you earlier. And now you want, <laughs> now you want this. this like, now you want this? Now you want this? <laughs> God. But she's just like, foot. <laughs> yeah, she, oh, look, foot. foot. You have come in my space, but you have foot. <laughs> <laughs> With fuzzy socks. <laughs> Michelle has a thing for socks. She has the fuzziest socks. She has the randomest socks. She has socks that are eggs. <laughs> I I think you need to explain that for us. <laughs> I think anybody listening may already know what Guretama is. <laughs> If you don't, give it a good Google. It's nothing uh, NSFW. It's cute as hell. Well, when you say give it a good Google, it sounds NSFW. So <laughs> That's why I said it ain't. <laughs> um, yes, I have socks with eggs on them. <laughs> no. She cracks an egg socks. open every morning, <laughs> puts her feet in it, and walks around. <laughs> I also have socks with a cat that's flipping off people with two fingers. Yeah. Yeah. I also that's that's what they do. That's what they do. I mean, it sucks. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah. I didn't mean for this to be this. But it was. Yeah, so I mean, Umbra, Penumbra, and Intumbra are three parts of a shadow. And basically, the Umbra is like the darkest part of the shadow. Right? Right? Mm Mm-hmm. The penumbra is the region where the light source is being like obscured. Okay. Right? And then the antumbra, like if we look here on like a definition, it says that the antumbra is a region from which the occluding body appears entirely within the disk of the light source. So an observer in this region experiences an annular eclipse in which a bright ring is visible around the eclipsing body. If the observer moves closer to the light source, the apparent size of the occluding body increases until it causes a full umbra. Oh yeah, I don't understand any of that. Without any more of that, let's move on over to Michelle's story. So from last week, I had given Michelle the prompt. You are newly hired as a scientist with the government and find out that every vaccine created starts a new disease. Ooh. Real. The story is called Trap of Complacency. Altruism. Zoology definition. Behavior by an animal that is not beneficial to or may be harmful to itself but that benefits others of its species. In that, I often wonder if humans as a species are lacking. She mumbled absentmindedly. Nonsense. She was always speaking nonsense. I'd always been confused about how she was even admitted to the institution. I didn't respond. I figured she didn't really want a response. Such unnecessary thoughts were a waste of time, only serving to distract from the problems at hand. In my opinion, immediate action is a much better use of time. If faced with a problem, try a solution, and if it doesn't work, try another solution. It was this way of thinking that got everyone here. The institution was full of geniuses, and people who prefer doing over thinking. A place where innovators and researchers alike convened in order to rid the world of deadly incurable diseases and improve on the methods that we already had. We were a group of the brightest minds the Earth had to offer. Researchers from our group were winning every international award possible for our continued contribution to world health and the elimination of sicknesses in general. I had only racked up three awards in the few months since I had been accepted to the facility. One 
was for my contribution to producing the first ever pill to work against the new C5 smallpox variant that was much more deadly and resistant to antibiotics than the previous C4 variant. Another one for cultivating a new strain of bacteria that could be ingested by mouth into the human body in order to eat cancerous cells, which was a major step in the right direction towards a cure for cancer. Finally, the last one was for successfully cloning a human body for the purpose of replacing broken and failing organs and limbs. All these advancements were groundbreaking in the medical world, whether it be doctors, surgeons, or experts in their field, everyone had nothing but praise for the institution. But for me, all that was good for was 15 minutes of fame. It's true that my initial goal for coming here was to aid in research to make the world a better and safer place. However, in order to keep my spot here, I had to do more than just contribute to an award-winning breakthrough. I had to make one myself. The second definition of altruism describes animals in particular doing things or making decisions that benefit other creatures besides themselves. If a creature exhibits this trait, it's indicative of a high level of intelligence. She was here again, just talking nonsense, or maybe she was actually trying to do something useful for once. It's the same with humans. The greater the intelligence, the greater chance the person will be altruistic and gracious. Again, I didn't respond to her, and I did my best to ignore her. It was morning time, and even though we had already won awards for the past projects, we still had to check in on them at least once every 24 hours, and today was my day. The first stop was the lab repairing the C5 variant tablet. I did a quick preliminary scan of the work and environment. Everything in the lab seemed to be in order. All the workers were wearing standard safety equipment, and nothing was out of place. Then, I began the checklist for the day. There was an adequate amount of inventory to reach the day's quota, no sick calls from staff, and the equipment reported perfect measurements for the mixture. Now all that was left was to check on the trials. The researcher that led this project had a lot riding on the success of it within a specific time frame. If he hadn't declared it ready for distribution in time, he would have lost all his advertisement deals and he wouldn't have been eligible for an award this year. That being said, he ended up releasing it before we had a chance to properly test it. However, knowing about his previous accomplishments, we were all certain that there wouldn't be an issue and agreed to send it through approval, then do the trials later. In the same way you decide whether someone is generous or selfish, you can also judge just how altruistic they are. Some synonyms for altruism are philanthropy, self-sacrificing, or even just kind. A rambling was the only thing I could hear ringing in my ears as I rounded the corner and heard the sound of my clipboard hitting the floor after having dropped it from pure shock. All 15 of the test subjects were dead. As I stood there in that heartbreaking scene, I smelled something I recognized. Hydrogen sulfide. Why was there this much poisonous gas in the testing room? I quickly covered my mouth with a cloth and ran back to the lab portion of the research room. Luckily, since I was still able to smell it, the amount wasn't too high yet. I evacuated everybody and contacted the person in charge of distribution, instructing them to issue a recall immediately. I couldn't be sure if the drug was what had triggered the gas or not, but I wasn't taking any chances. Human arrogance has always been a disease in and of itself, she said. She was right, of course. What probably happened here must have been a result of our negligence due to proper testing because we were all sure that the researcher's notes and calculations were perfect, so we skipped to human clinical trials without even double-checking his work. I began frantically scanning through the digital notes I had on my phone, trying to make sure that the gas wasn't triggered by the pill we had developed. 
but it didn't take me long to find our mistake. If we had just read through two pages of his work, we would have found that the proposed chemicals we were using were measured incorrectly. The levels of chemicals used would be too potent for the cells in the body to absorb, causing the cells to release the three enzymes which are known to synthesize hydrogen sulfide in excess. Why didn't we check? Arrogance. Again, she was right. I began typing up an email for the lead researcher because I wasn't able to get a hold of him via phone call. After I sent it off, I noticed that the head of HR was standing next to me. She had been patiently waiting for me to finish what I was doing before she asked me if I needed the rest of the day off after something so traumatic. Even though she said the words and asked the question, I could see that I didn't actually have an option here. She wanted me to continue on with the day as if nothing had happened. According to her, these types of things were common. I told her that I was fine and preferred to continue working through the day. After some pleasantries, which were only pleasant by definition, we parted ways. It was an uncomfortable feeling to have a conversation on the backdrop of bodies being carried out of the lab. She was even inquiring how I had the number for the lead distributor, as if I shouldn't have called them at all. You'd think that doing the research and producing life-saving medicine would be a textbook example of altruism. But when you consider that there's always two sides to a coin, the question becomes, is altruism even possible? She was right every once in a while but most of the time she was just annoying. I was behind schedule now. I had to hurry and check on the other projects or I wouldn't have any time to continue with my own research. On the floor above was the lab with a new strain of bacteria that was supposed to eat cancerous cells. Walking through the door, I was greeted by a few of the other researchers as if nothing had happened downstairs. Of course, Nothing had happened for them. I didn't know if it was right to tell them or not tell them, or if I had to just continue as if everything was normal. The first definition for altruism pertaining to humans is showing a selfless concern for the well-being of others, unselfish. It's odd that the definition for it changes slightly when we're talking about animals. As a result, altruistic traits are more impressive in animals than in people. At this point, I really wish that she would shut up. There were always staggering amounts of money invested whenever cancer research was involved, and all of it went to good use. We had the top-of-the-line equipment and an almost infinite supply of resources. Even with the best equipment money could buy, we still had to be very careful with the new bacteria strain as it was extremely unstable. The researcher who stumbled across this new life form had created it by accident and had no idea how to recreate it or even make it multiply naturally. In other words, we had to keep it alive to the best of our abilities until we could figure out how to recreate it. I started with the inventory check and immediately noticed that we were low on supplies. I asked around the lab looking for any misplaced boxes of inventory or late shipments. There was nothing. It was our job to go around to each of the award-winning projects we were a part of and make sure that it was running smoothly. The people who checked here before me clearly didn't know how to do their job as no one even bothered to order more supplies. In a huff, I logged it onto the computer in the restricted office, only meant for researchers with the highest clearance. I finished compiling a list of supplies to order, but was not able to send it off due to the lack of funds. I stared at the error message for a bit. How is it possible that we were out of funds for this project? Just then, I was forcefully logged out of the system and was sitting there staring at the login screen again. I was really behind schedule now, and at this rate, 
I wouldn't be able to even make it to my lab at all today. But in order for this project to succeed, we needed more supplies. I logged back into the computer and tried to order supplies again, thinking that the previous error was some kind of glitch. But there it was again, a lack of funds. I immediately started searching through the logs fearing the worst. I could see different amounts of money deposited randomly throughout the month, but for every deposit, there was a withdrawal for that exact amount a week later. Embezzlement. All the donations, all the investments were being stolen right before our eyes. Greed. How disgusting. I would argue the worst of the human diseases. Again, I agreed with her. With a heavy heart, I prepared to make a report attaching the logs to an email that I was going to send company-wide. I wasn't sure how high up the corruption went. I just wanted to make sure that as much people as possible knew about this. But I was forcefully logged out again. I started to feel nauseous. Was it because I inhaled too much poison earlier? Or was it my own guilt? Success breeds all kinds of new diseases. Next thing I knew, there was a knocking at the door to the office, which was only a warning as the door opened right after that without me giving permission. In walked the head of HR again. I was told that the computer needed repairs and that I was to leave the rest of the lab checklist to her. And with a smile on my face, I did as I was told. Moving much slower than I had all day, weighed down with my own thoughts, I finally arrived at the lab that was housing the clone we had made. We kept it inside a glass cryo chamber that we left dark because the other researchers thought it was unsettling. And we always made sure someone was monitoring its vitals. The purpose of this was to see how long exactly we'd be able to store body parts assembled this way. The researcher, whose job it was to monitor it, wasn't there by the time I arrived. I assumed that maybe they went to the bathroom, but I would still check up on them after I finished my inspection. Clipboard and pencil in hand again, I was just going through the checklist making sure all the vitals were normal, trying to forget all the previous incidents of the day. There was definitely no such thing as an altruistic corporation, that much is obvious, but then does that mean we expect more compassion from animals than we do the institution? Making notes of each vitality measurement and chemical balance in the clone was tedious but also calming. Until I reached a new monitor that hadn't been there the last time I was on duty, it was a brain activity monitor. The clone wasn't supposed to have any brain activity at all, save for the basic function it needed to carry out to keep itself alive, like breathing. I stared at the blank monitor. What's the opposite of altruism? As I stared at the monitor, my breath hitched in my throat as a steady beeping noise started coming from it, and I started to see the brain waves propagate on the screen. Arrogance, greed, corruption. I couldn't see what was happening inside the glass cryo chamber, so I rushed to the light switch and turned it on. The dark glass chamber in the room lit up to reveal the clone with its face leaning up on the glass and both its hands on either side of its head, eyes wide open staring right at me. I didn't understand what I was looking at. I couldn't make out what I was seeing in his eyes. Fear? Confusion? Anger? Why was it even able to convey anything to me? Who made it capable of conscious thought? It was only supposed to be used for extra parts. With my back against the wall, I melted down onto the floor, staring at it as it crouched down as well to keep eye level with me, peering at me with its hands still on the glass. Arrogance, greed, inhumanity, 
runs as deep as any medical sickness. I couldn't make any more excuses, and I couldn't turn a cheek away anymore. She was right. She'd always been right. She was me, after all. What'd you think? That was fun. (laughs) (laughs) That was wild. Right? Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, okay, cool. We're going to go ahead and grab the the cancerous eating disease and bring it to the the sulfide room and have it eat all that and just feed it. But then it's like, no. No, we got to keep it alive. I didn't realize it was like a living thing that just... I thought she had created it. But then it's like, okay, no, she was a part of the projects. Cool. Yeah. So I was like, oh, look at that. What a wild time. Yeah, so I did a lot of research for this one, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like, so much research. So, at first, I don't know. So I tried to keep, like, this, this I don't know, like, underlying theme of, I guess, altruism, <laughs> clearly, um, contrasted by, like, what's actually happening. So it's like, you know, I just, to be honest, I just saw the word, I just learned about the word altruism. I'm like, I like that. And then I put it in here. I mean, the word altruism is a fun word. Well, I learned it in uh, relation to animals. So I was like, okay, in animals, it sounds really like profound and like cool and everything like that. But in people, it's never talked about. It's never referenced because it's kind of like equated to generosity and stuff like that. And when you talk about people and being generous, it's kind of like, oh, some people are, some people aren't. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's it's like some people are and some people aren't altruistic or generous or whatever. But if we see it in animals, we're like, oh, my God, holy shit. Right. Because it's like, you know, like it says, that's that's evidence of intelligence. Exactly. So then it makes you wonder about what like there's no question human beings are intelligent, but like mostly. (laughs) Yeah. It brings into question our intelligence, actually, I think. Maybe because I'm just so so skewed on humanity. But I just don't feel like humans can be truly altruistic. That's actually, like, um... That's true. Because, like, if you ever do something nice for somebody, what do you get in return? Even if it's not something, um, like, physical, like, a favor later or anything like that. Or, like, the person, you know what I mean? You get, like, from yourself, you get a feeling of, oh, I'm a good person. So in the end, you your benefit is that you feel like you're a good person, right? Right. And that's not technically altruistic. Well, that's the thing, like a lot of people, like like you're saying, you, you do things because like, oh, you know, I'm a generous person, so therefore giving you a gift is a good deed. You don't have something, I'll give it to you. And although you're not vocalizing it, you want everyone to see you as that kind of like generous good person so it's like yeah you're not altruistic you're just um i forgot the word for it but you know like yeah but you see all those videos of people just like hey there's a bunch of homeless people here this one's within a shot of a camera have some money yeah so like in that, that's not altruistic either because exactly. you're getting views. And that's what you want. So, like, maybe true altruism is doing something without expecting a benefit. I think true altruism means that you're doing something without realizing that you have, like, any benefit of all. Like, maybe later on you might be like, oh, you know what? It felt good doing that for somebody. But I think when you're doing something, and it just it's just like a natural reaction or just a natural thing that you may not think anything of. But they think like they're grateful for it or anything like that. That's more altruism. Like that's like yeah, that no, yeah, more. I think yeah. so. Doing something for somebody without expecting something in return or feeling a certain way afterwards and not really expecting that you're doing something so great or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, that's an example, a specific kind of definition of altruism. In the end, I'd still just... Humans are not altruistic creatures. Um, it's a wild life that we have. You know, I, I feel like... Uh, 
We'll just splice human and animal DNA together and make better people. Wow. That'd be terrifying. Okay, Satan. Jesus. <laughs> Did I not just go through like a medical dissertation of why we shouldn't do shit like that? <laughs> <laughs> but altruism. <laughs> that voice is not going to be right this time. It's me. <laughs> so did you, like, think that she was a different person at the beginning? No. You thought that she was her the whole time? Yeah, because when it said she mumbled up mindedly, I just had it in that she was talking. And after, I was like, okay, so it's her talking to herself. Yeah. And, um, I don't I just picked it up that way. And then as I went through, I'm like, this is clearly in her brain. The institution must not be what she's thinking it is. It is an institution. Yeah. But <laughs> no, no, she... She good. Like, eh, I just put it, and then I'm like, you know, I'm not going to bother trying it was to... It's good story building, you know, like, having it there. Like, it, it works really well, and it helps on each part, because it broke up the story in sections like, this is what's happening, and then in altruism, this is directly related to what's happening here. So, like, everybody got to learn a little bit about altruism and things of that sort. Yeah, I was trying to make it like I was. I was trying to make it not uh, be too disjointing, so I'll try to make it like mm-hmm. kind of make sense. And every once in a while, it was kind of supposed to be just like a reflection of her, her, her like my actual thoughts, like not not like me, like Mash, like um, oh, right, like my the character. Yeah. Um. So it was supposed to be like yeah, a reflection of her thoughts, and it's just like um an example of someone kind of like having that nagging voice in the back of their head, but ignoring it just to go about their daily life. Life. Exactly. Yeah. So, brain things. Brain peace. Yeah. But that was, it was a really good read, and it's, like, back on the, it's not even back on, on MASH track, because, like, it wasn't dark and depressing, but it's definitely getting there. You don't think this was dark and depressing? No. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> no, I mean, ultimately, like, I don't know if anybody really thinks of the government as a good place. So, so like, you expected it to be? Yeah, you expect it to be like that. And, I mean, how many companies have you worked in where terrible things happen, and they are just like, are you gonna take the day off? And it's just are like, you, n- no. Are you sure you're not just used to my shit? Because this one was like... No, because it just seems like, first of all, the government, and second of all, employment, and, like, you know, I expect people... To just, like, because this isn't a fantasy world that we usually write about, this is more of a real world, it's not dark. If this is a fantasy world, it'd probably be darker, because in fantasy worlds, things are supposed to be a little bit lighter and happier, or extremely dark and gritty, depending on the type of world that you're writing. But in just a regular, today, society, um, I'm not anti-government, but I also just don't care. So it's like, oh, someone from HR and everyone's had those experiences with HR where they're not actually there for the benefit of you, but they're actually benefit of the company. Where it's just yeah. like, okay, these people are dead. Don't <laughs> tell anyone. And let's go on a better day and just keep a smile on our face. That's exactly what I was trying to go. Okay, so these people are dead. <laughs> yeah. And like, how many times has that happened? You know, like, people die on a daily basis. HR always says, look away. Yep. HR says you didn't see anything. How'd you get the number to the to the person? To yeah. The stock right. How did you get numbers? We're trying to work on embezzlement schemes here. How did you get the numbers? Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, I've worked in very bad places, as you can all tell. You know, I'm I'm really curious. I want to know what everyone thinks on this. Um, we have a contact us page on our site that says, you know, like our, there's gonna be like an email information sheet. You can fill that out. Let us know what you think about altruism. Do you think that humans can actually be altruistic? Do you think it's really amazing to see altruism in animals or just because of the behavior that animals always exhibit? It's kind of like, yeah, I could definitely see animals being altruistic on a daily basis. So just your thoughts, anything like that. And as usual, I want to know if you guys have any prompts for us for following weeks, which leads us to next week's prompts. Next week's prompt from Michelle from me is going to be a genie tricks someone into swapping places with them. 
Ah, yes. And my prompt for Kristen is a witch loses her powers and cannot get them back. Because fun. this is Kristen's nightmare. And so I was like, let me make you write. Exactly. It's definitely the worst thing um, ever in life. For me personally, I just find that any magical creature losing their magic, regardless if they want the magic in the first place or not, is just the worst thing that could possibly happen because you get like a piece of your soul ripped out of you. All right. Well, (laughs) (laughs) we hope you guys like this week's episode. And as usual, tune in next week for more fun. Where else? Um, this is our 10th episode, yes? Woo! Yes, our 10th episode. And from the beginning, we said that if we reach 10 episodes... When we reach 10 episodes? When we, if, we're gonna put our stuff on Spotify. Spoopy. Yeah! So, we're gonna be on Spotify so you can listen to us in, like, a playlist, and now it's more accessible to people who don't have the Podbean app, which is awesome i know like so many people listen to podcasts through spotify so i'm ex- i'm excited for this and like um yeah we're gonna it'll be good so from this episode so all of our stuff should be on spotify is it on there too <laughs> no <laughs> before our 11th episode comes out we're gonna have a playlist of all of our stories on Spotify. Once Spotify approves our podcast, we're just going to put a link to it in the description of this episode and maybe in the other episodes too, just to have the link there. Exactly. Bye. Bye everyone. But embezzlement. Embezzly. Embezzly. That's what you call someone who embezzles, but really stupidly. Oh, <laughs> uh, are you an embezzly? <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> How do you try embezzling the money? My pocket. I, I had to f*** <laughs> with you. I absolutely had to. <laughs> Next time I'll be a bird and I'll have to f*** <laughs> on all the statues. <laughs> Only our divine energy can clean them. <laughs> it's darkness. Ha <laughs> <laughs>